me just preface this by saying I am fangirling so hard <laughs> with Rico right now. We have known each other via um, ISDN line yes. for about five years now, but we've never met in the flesh. She so was this on, is like a serious moment for me. She was on Dinner Party Download many times, but always from the faraway land called New York yes. while we recorded here in Los Angeles. And now I know that the voice has a face. It does. And it's very pleasant to meet you at long last. Thank you. Yay. Um, and I'm very honored to be here. And also, I should note that uh, we're going to be talking about technology. I'm not here because I know anything about technology. It's because we're both public radio people and we like each other. We so like hang. I'm, hopefully we'll learn as much as you folks here tonight. Um, easy softball question. When was the first time that you remember sort of interacting with technology and going, this is interesting to me? Okay, so never is my answer. I was so not interested in, I mean, I'm like the typical girl who thought she was bad at math and was crying in the bathroom in third grade because I couldn't get it. And um, in 10th grade, I remember there was a math teacher, a man, who said, you're just not very good at this thing. So we're gonna, move, you're not gonna go to calculus, you're gonna go to statistics. And I was like, okay. Um, I now know that that's total bullshit, yeah. <laughs> and uh, if I had to do it over again, I would make a big change. But I was one of those people who thought, like, oh, tech, science, math, this is not for me. Um, uh, so two questions. Have you gone back to that guy and been like, yeah? I think he's dead, actually. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, serves him right. Yeah. Um, um, well, then I guess the other question is, so what leads you to okay. then make your career about tech? Right. So what happened was this thing. It completely changed everything about my life. And I started to look around and realize that tech was changing. Um, it wasn't just a tool anymore. It was changing the way that we fell in love. It was changing the way that we parented. It was changing how we got to work, where we did our work, what the work was that we were doing when we were there. And so to me, it was really about the stories. Like there was this moment of uh, in 2000, sort of seven, eight, nine, ten, in that area where it was like, I used to do X this way. And then this happened, and now I tap a button and a car appears. You know, like, it really felt like there was this very profound shift. And as a journalist, um, I'm always looking for those moments, right? Like, where something is happening, and, and you're there to watch it. And it really um, was exciting to me, because it was like, oh, if I'm a tech person now, then everybody's a tech person, because we're all dealing with this. And it, it just seemed really... Extraordinary. Do you remember a moment where it was like, I now think or behave differently? Because that's kind of the crux of what you do, is how Little technology moments. affects us in ways that we wouldn't expect. I do, and uh, I ended up making a career out of it. It was a moment where I was um, making this podcast, and I sat down, you know, I'm super type A, and was like, I'm going to sit down and come up with 20 ideas to kill it on the podcast. Such a dork. And, um, and I had actually a very profound moment where like, n n like the blank page stayed blank and it really freaked me out. And I, so I sort of was like, wait, when I've always been, I think, a creative person, when, what is different now? What, what feels different now? And I just sort of started to think um, of little moments in my day and I realized like, oh, every little moment that I used to just think about things, waiting in line for my coffee, uh, getting on the subway, all of those little tiny cracks in my day, I now look at this. Mm. And it made me think like, well, that's good, right? It means that I'm never bored and only boring people get bored or whatever. And then I was like, but wait a minute. Could this be why I feel like there's nothing going on in my brain? Did it li literally feel like a fog? Like it felt, things were not coming out of your brain? It was way? different than writer's block, because I've had that. It was like there was sand. If you've ever played, um, uh, like, if you've ever played a game on your phone for, like, way too long... Oh, never. Right. Okay, it's, like, around the two-hour mark, <laughs> yeah. and you stop, and you're like... Yeah. That's what it felt like. It feels almost like a nausea yes, in a way. Yes, exactly right, exactly. Yeah, not good when you, like, your paycheck depends on your brain. Um, 
Let's, this may be a great place, I would say, to pivot to the theme of this sort of series that we're doing here at Belf, um, which is, huh, I'm going to look at it again because I always get it backwards. Ignorance in the age of information, yes. not information in the age of ignorance. Yes. Although they are somewhat interchangeable. It's kind of, yeah, it's like a palindrome. <laughs> but we, so did anybody here actually see Latif Nasser from Radiolab here a few weeks ago? Did anyone see this? He's the best, right? He is Isn't their he friends. Like, oh my God, I love him so All much. All public radio people are friends. Did he That's have big he hair or him. small hair? He, oh, he had small hair. He had small, oh my God, when Latif has big hair, it's like, <laughs> um, he's Next amazing. Time. He's a big brain too. I will, yes. And one of the things that he talked about in his presentation was this MIT study, I think it was, yeah. where they looked at a huge amount of Twitter data to determine how fast false information spread as opposed to true information, a true story versus a false story. And in his words, it's worse than we thought. It's something <laughs> like 70% faster a false story will spread on Twitter. Because they're than, just so much more interesting, right? Well, and so they make you outraged and you just got to retweet them. Well, that's, uh, I will say that the first question that came to my mind was how is that happening? Yeah. And then I listened to your new podcast. Oh, cool. The second season thereof. Yeah. Called Zigzag. Go download it off of iTunes. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Rico. And the first two episodes are about another study yes. that actually answers that question. So why don't you tell us about that? Yeah. So we um, partnered with the Knight Foundation. Um, they're a foundation that is there to protect journalism, to make sure journalism continues and doesn't get eaten by Facebook and Google. Um, and they did really great research with a, a Matt Hindman at George Washington University. And what they wanted to do is they, they knew that there were all these millions of tweets spreading false information, but they wanted to map, like, where were they coming from? What was the source? So they took um, certain, like, slices of Twitter before the election in 2016 and then another slice later. And so they had millions and millions and millions of tweets, right? And then they mapped them to see where the URLs were all pointing back to. And I'd say that traditionally, if there's any tradition in the tech world, but traditionally the idea has been like, what's the point of removing false news or, or people who are you know, putting out fake news? Uh, because it's whack-a-mole. Something else is just gonna show up, right? That's what the, the tech companies have always said. Like, well, if we get rid of it, there's just gonna be another one that shows up. But actually, what these researchers found was that the source of the false information went back to just around 50, 40 to 50 websites. Not a lot. In, and they were consistent. They were always the ones where, that were the source of the false information. And I think what I found even more interesting was that these sites, and some of them were Russian propaganda, other are ones that you've heard of, Infowars or other things. These sites are putting out normal news most of the time. 95 to 98% of the time, it's just normal news. And then it's that sort of, two to five percent of what they put out there that is so specific and so targeted and sent out just at the right time that it does what Latif said. It just goes whoosh, like wildfire, right? It just pumps across Twitter. And some of that is from people who, you know, unwitting tweeters, but of course it's also bots. Right. Lots and lots of bots. And I, I will say that the first thing that I thought when I listened to this was that these are websites. These are not They're 50 websites. Twitter handles. No, no. These are websites that are, I mean, relatively established websites. Okay. They have newsrooms. They put out news, but they also uh, play dirty. Yes. So my, that kills my next question because I was like, why don't we just shut those down? Well, Problem solved. That's what the researchers said. They're like, well, part of the, there's the First Amendment, right? So <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> there's that. Um, but I think we're at this moment where, um, depending on how you interpret the First Amendment um, and whether or not the tech companies, ought, they're private companies, they don't have to be held to that. They could decide. Um, but we have seen that when you, when you do, like when InfoWars was taken off of all of those um, platforms over the summer, traffic plummeted. So it works. What else... Uh, can we do other than, I mean, because obviously it, it is hard given the First Amendment it and is hard. laws and the money required to like go after private organizations. Yeah. 
Well, I think, you know, on a short term, I'm not going to say anything that you guys don't know. Like, click before you retweet, check what the source is, you know, all of the, the very basic media literacy things that you are at a, God, this place is beautiful, fantastic academic institution. You, you, you know these things, right? And, and, but I think what we need to look at, at is more systemically, right? Because each of us, one person, it's not about the one person. It's about us as uh, entire societies. We're at a point um, where, as one sociologist put it, uh, common sense doesn't apply anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, this was actually fascinating me that kind of evolutionarily we are not ready to deal in a way with Twitter? Exactly, exactly. Explain how, how that so is. So he, um, gosh, his name, it, he's friends with Eric Kleinenberg, who was here. Um, I oh. can't, it's on the last podcast. In any <laughs> case, um, this idea that common sense is like, if I get get into an elevator, have you ever noticed how everyone just shifts their bodies so there's always the equidistant distance between all of us? Um, it's common sense, right? We know how to act around people. Like, it'd be super weird if I got in an elevator and it was just the two of us and I was like right up against you, you'd be freaked out. But if the entire elevator was full, that would be acceptable behavior. So what he's saying though, is that we're at this point where we have never seen human behavior on mass at scale, where millions of people are acting uh, as, as herds essentially, right? So the regular rules of human behavior do not apply. This is new. Um, I just think that makes so much sense. And then you, you ask lawmakers to decide how these, these platforms should be um, regulated or, or what, what sort of, what is correct behavior on there and they're applying the old logic to it. Um, so my thinking is, like, and it's not just me, that technologists have to be, uh, they need to be in places where, with the lawmakers, explaining to them that they need to be anticipating changes, talking them, not that we even know, because I do think life is an experiment right now, mm -hmm. no doubt about that. We are the lab for a lot mm -hmm. of these things, um, but, um, but that's a choice, like, that's a choice that the CEO of Twitter needs to make, that like, he's not going to ban someone off the platform, or as they just said, they are now going to ban people who, um, who incite uh, hostile behavior or violence. But is there maybe some hope in the idea that maybe evolutionarily we can come to adapt to understand how to do this? Or do you think it's just too much too fast for us to catch up with it? Damn, that's a big question. Um, uh, the, the robots will figure it out for us. AI is coming. <laughs> Great. I, that's going to change it all, all over again. As, as, as a, one of the blockchain founders said, we live in exponential times. Let, let's talk about blockchain, actually. Oh, should we do that? Because you just dropped that word very Boom. cleverly. And like all of these people went like this <laughs> in the audience. They're here to, how many, how many have actually heard ZigZag? Uh, show of hands? Oh my it's God, okay. we're gonna Don't convert be embarrassed. you tonight. It's, that's great, you've got like a thousand new, a thousand? A hundred. A thousand. New listeners. Yeah, fake it news, It feels like dude. a thousand, it's the, it's the spirit <laughs> in the room. Uh, blockchain, Let's, this is maybe perhaps, perhaps a more positive technological thing to talk about than Twitter. Maybe. We hope, well, we'll get to that part. But let's fir <laughs> first tell us what blockchain is and why it could be a solve for some problems. Okay, so have, how many of you have heard of blockchain? How many of you feel like you understand what blockchain is? Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah, I, I was there four. too. I was there too. Um, so, let me, I'm gonna couch it in a story because it's so much more interesting if we do it that way. Okay. Um, I, my executive producer and I uh, quit our jobs at New York Public Radio in the spring um, and one of the reasons was because we had a philanthropist come to us and say, we think the work you're doing in tech and ethics should be much bigger. And we were like, sweet. Uh, so we left and then the whole grant fell through. So lesson, get it in writing before you quit your job. In any case though, these weird, this weird like rescue operation came and saved us and it was essentially a startup that um, wants to create a new way to have sustainable journalism. So I, like the way I like to think of it is like Facebook, but without the creepy data collection and micro-targeted ads, yes. just good information. And so, and they said the way we're gonna do this is um, with blockchain and crypto economics. And we're like, we have 
no idea what you're talking about. And they said, and we're going to give you a grant. And we're like, okay, so we're in. Um, <laughs> we'll learn all about yeah, whatever you exactly. want us to learn about. But then I was like, I said to Jen, my co-founder, I was like, well, that's the story. It's two moms who quit their stable jobs to start a business doing something they don't know what it is. And they need to explain it to themselves. And actually, well, that's what we do. We explain tech in normal layman's languages and explain the actual use cases for it. So there's the story. Ta-da. Hey, and now you get to do the explaining part. Okay, so think <laughs> of Google Docs. Um, there's multiple ways to explain it. But think of Google Docs, right? Like if, if you and I share a doc, I go in there and change something. You can see that I've changed it. And if you change something, I can see that you've changed it, right? Nobody can change anything without everybody who has access to the Google Doc knowing. Okay, now take away Google. Google doesn't own the platform. Um, instead of it being centralized with Google, uh, it's a doc that is actually shared on like a necklace of computers, right? So it's like a hive brain that is holding onto it. And it can only exist when all the computers agree whenever there's a change that happens. Um, so in theory, that means that it, it is immutable, that no one can actually hack a blockchain. A blockchain has never been hacked because there's a, there's a backup system, right? It doesn't exist without a backup system. But what has been hacked, billions of dollars hacked, are uh, wallets that hold cryptocurrencies where the exchanges happen um, that are based on blockchain. Did that but, work? Not entirely. Yes. But you know what? Episode two, we have a song. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and it's really funny. Uh, and you won't be able to get it out of your head. Yeah, it's a little bit of an earworm. So warning. warning. Um, but more or less, the, my understanding is that the kind of biggest boon to society that this could create yes. is that because there are all these computers and because they all kind of share what you call a virtual ledger, a virtual ledger? Yes, is that a what distributed it is? ledger. A distributed yes. ledger uh -huh. that you can trace any piece of information or any product. <laughs> yes, so back there's to many different source. use case scenarios, right? One use case is this idea, um, so it's supply chains. The idea that, like, if you had, you picked a head of lettuce in a field, um, in California, that it would be marked on the ledger and that when it was, by the time it made it to your plate in a restaurant, you'd be able to trace entirely back to where the lettuce was picked. Now, why do you care about tracing the lettuce? Let's say there was an E. coli outbreak. Right now, it takes the FDA weeks, if not months, to be able to figure out the source of an outbreak. With this, you'd be able, to, it would take seconds. You'd be like, where does this lettuce come from? It'd be all linked. It's complicated though, right? You but, but yes, and the other thing, the, the one detail that I'm then going to say something nasty about is that all of, basically there are no, in a, in, when a blockchain system is put together, human beings don't enter in the, into the equation, right? Correct. That's, which is supposedly the positive thing about it. Smart contracts is the idea. The idea being this. like, let's say, um, the way I think of it is like, <laughs> one of the examples I use, like let's say, you said to your, you have two friends, and the friend was like, I am going to, oh, that's profane, I'm going to come up, you have two children, my children, and my daughter says to my son, I'm going to clean your room if you give me your Halloween candy, and he's like, all right, cool, but knowing my son, he'll eat the Halloween candy watching her clean her room, right? In a smart contract, if they issued a smart contract, my weird children, um, it would like hold the Halloween candy in escrow and like the minute the room was clean, it would deliver it to her, right? Okay. It would take my son out of the equation. Right. So you don't, like, you don't trust my son, maybe. <laughs> Which sorry. I don't. Yes, Sounds I like. know. He's 11 and dangerous. <laughs> um, he, no, but there is a possibility that he would screw his little sister over. So yes. in this case... Take him out of the equation. She does the job. She gets her candy. Everybody's happy. Right, which seems great because human beings can be nasty or duplicitous or even just make mistakes. Yes. But I will also tell you, as soon as I heard this on the podcast, I'm like, great, a whole bunch of computers talking to each other with no human interaction. Yes. Keeping track of everything. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> So tell me, well, tell me what could possibly go wrong. So many things. Uh, I'll tell you what is going wrong because it's always the bad people who make the good tech work first. Uh, Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin is the number one use case for blockchain. Bitcoin 
runs on a blockchain. It's called the Bitcoin blockchain. Very uh, creative naming uh, strategy there. Um, and what are people using it for? To launder money, to pay for drugs, sex, you name it, to uh, arms. Um, and the idea initially was that it's anonymous, right? So a lot of terrible, terrible things that Bitcoin is being used for. Uh, I, I think it was um, actually a lot of the fake news that was um, pumped out by the Russian trolls was they actually purchased many of their sub subscriptions and paid for a lot of it with Bitcoin. Wow. Yeah, there are good things. As somebody said to me, um, he said, my dad lives in Venezuela and the currency has zero value right now. Uh, it's illegal to own US dollars in Venezuela. He told his dad he should, needs to buy cryptocurrency, bit, buy Bitcoin. So in places where there is a non-functioning currency, the idea of a digital money kind of makes a lot of sense. I guess then, since again, we're talking about the problems that are brought about by an information society. Yes. At what point, I mean, this is a very broad question. Tie it back. May, <laughs> this is... This is a pretty broad question, but maybe there's a, we can talk about a mechanism. By what mechanism do we determine, or can we determine, that a technology has tipped over from being useful? Because basically every, every technology is created to solve a problem, right? And then it creates its own problems. Yes. So at what point do we decide that the problems it creates are not worth the problem it's solving? Well, what you have <laughs> so beautifully and eloquently spelled yeah, well, out I is think that... probably not. <laughs> But that's um, your job. Is, that's my job. Exactly. You, we can't. There, technology is never neutral. Don't listen to anyone in Silicon Valley who will tell you that. It's bullshit. It's like saying, guns don't kill people. People kill people. It's bullshit. Technology is not neutral. It is made by humans. It is programmed by humans. The algorithms are written by humans. And so all the things that we hold true or dear or we discriminate against or any of those things, uh, consciously or unconsciously, are baked into it. And so tech is good and bad. It's just that confusing. I, uh, <laughs> I agree. But is there... Have you talked to anybody, because in your books you speak to neuropsychologists yeah, yeah. and uh, you know, scientists as well as politicians and all this kind of stuff. Is there any conversation about deciding when and how somehow shut it we, down. Ne we need Just to... Just shut it yeah, down. There's a kill switch somewhere that we can well, stop Twitter actually, before it ruins the next democracy? There are you know, fascist countries where they have pulled the switch on the internet. I don't think we yeah, want that, true. so... I mean, I think of it just like every day. I, I do this dance with Twitter, right? Like, I actually really like Twitter. I talk to my listeners a lot. I love watching real events happen. Um, I'm a big fan. But then every once in a while, like, it's gross and disgusting. And I just turn it off completely. And I know some people are like, I'm out. And they switch it off. Right now, it's on the consumer right? It's on the consumer to make these decisions. And I don't think that that's the right way it should go. I think regulation is the way that we need to go for a lot of it. But let's actually go that way for uh, one on more. On the consumer? Turn it. Yeah, it. Yes. Well, I mean, you wrote a whole book about this. I did. Which is, which is interesting to me because you are obviously a tech person who likes tech. But if I was going to boil it down, I would say the theme of your book is that if you want to be a creative person, you really need to unhook from technology. Yes. Explain why. Caveat, though. Um, I have had people... So the book is called Bored and Brilliant, and it goes back to the original thing I was saying about that moment where I like started to wonder, um, I'm never bored. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? And then um, I, as journalists do, fell down a rabbit hole to try and understand what happens in your brain when you get bored and what could potentially happen if we never get bored ever again because we never have to be bored. And collectively, would that be a bad thing? Um, and so I talked to neuroscientists and, and cognitive psychologists who explained that like, we're at an amazing moment in understanding um, some of the brain networks, specifically the one um, that is related to mind wandering. Uh, it's, it's called the default mode of your brain. So this is when you're folding laundry or you're wandering across campus and you wander that way every single day so you don't need to pay any attention and your mind just goes, right? So if you think of boredom as like the gateway to mind wandering, and you're like, great, spacing out. Didn't we all get in trouble for that? Well, 
Turns out you do amazing work if you do what's called positive constructive mind wandering. That's a thing. Um, and that is when you actually do your most creative thinking. You take one idea from over here and another idea from there and you smash them together. You create something new. Um, you do incredible problem solving and you do something that I had never heard of called autobiographical planning. This is, it's not, they have the best names for all this stuff. <laughs> autobiographical planning, you look back at your life last week, 10 years ago, you take note of the highs and lows. You come up with like the story of yourself up to now and then you zoom into the future and you think of who you want to be or what you want to achieve and then you set the steps that you want to take to achieve those goals. It's like time travel in your brain basically. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool shit. I'm not answering your question though. Which, um, so what I ended up doing um, is I ended up asking my listeners, like, are you feeling like your digital habits are messing with your brain? Would you be willing for one week to try, like, you know, I, I love a little hack, like weird experiments with me to see if we got more bored, what would happen? Um, and um, I think. That's precisely what we discovered, actually, Rico, is that it's on us to decide when the technology works because it's awesome and it's a great tool and when the technology takes over and it becomes our taskmaster. And if we can't uh, observe our own behavior, then there's that moment where you're drooling and playing two dots like I do. There's, a, there's actually, I forgot I was going to bring in the book out here because there's a passage where you're talking about that default mode. Yes. And it's, the, it's a, sci, a neuropsychologist, I think, or a neuroscientist that yeah. you're talking to who is using the example of having an argument. It's the different, the two modes of your brain. Yes. There's one mode of your brain that is taking in information right now and dealing with whatever is happening yep. to you right now. And then the default mode is what is happening when you're not taking in tons of information and it's just kind of semi at rest. And he was using the uh, example of an argument. Yeah. And tell what happened and so I'll follow up with I think you're talking about the negative part of mind wandering. So like... No, no, quite the opposite. Oh. This is the, the idea being that if you are, like if you're having an argument with somebody, yeah. you're in that first mode and... Then you walk away and come up with like a zinger that you should have said. No, no, this, that's the, is that, am I getting this wrong? I thought that was the well, default the, mode. Well, that's exactly right. Yeah, yes. no, you're totally right. So it's like in the moment, you're more likely to be like ginned up ah. and like, yes, exactly. But if you that's step back. That's a technical back, term as well. <laughs> and a day later, your brain slips into this default right. mode, re-examines that argument and goes, oh, I see where that person was coming from. Or, and I'll just go dark here for a moment, People are very, psychologists are very clear, like there is a downside to mind wandering. It is also linked to depression and anxiety because the ruminating state is also in mind wandering. This is where you're like, oh, I should have said that. Why didn't I say that? I should have said that. He's such a jerk. He's such a jerk. I'm a jerk. I'm a horrible jerk. I'm, I'm the jerk. I'm the jerk. <laughs> like, you know, you can't, yeah. those little OCD going on there. And, um, but so I think if we are mindful that positive constructive mind wandering is the goal, because I'm all about the goals, with yes. the type A persona thing, making it work. Um, and it was amazing. We had 20,000 people sign up to do this one week of experiments. Um, and every day we asked them to do something a little bit weird with their phone. That sounds weird. That sounds strange. <laughs> like, for example, um, we asked them to put it in your pocket when you're in transit. So, like, literally, if you're on the bus or walking across campus or or even just going to the bathroom, because we all take it there, um, don't have your phone in front of you. Put it in your bag or put it in your pocket. And we would release a little mini podcast episode to explain some of the designs that go into our technology that keep us um, hooked, essentially. Um, because that's the business model, right? It's time with our eyeballs. That's how these companies make money. That's why Facebook is free. Uh, it's collecting information, it is collecting, it keeps you coming back. Um, so every single day we tried something different and we also, because people love to quantify themselves, we, uh, we partnered with some apps so people could measure how many times a day like, did, like they, could, they were checking their phone or not checking their phone. How often were they doing it? Oh, a lot, <laughs> like a lot. But I, I almost think that they were less than the normal you know, person. They were self-identifying. Yeah, right. But these were these little indie apps that I, I 
connected with the developers of these apps and was like, so one of them, it's called Moment. It's this guy, Kevin. He's a um, developer in Pittsburgh. And he made the app because he and his uh, new wife were having trouble getting through dinner without looking at their phones. So he, isn't that like the most romantic, dorky thing you've ever heard? He, bu he built her an app. And um, it's the best. So I partnered with Kevin, and we had everybody download Moment, and, and then he was able to um, anonymize the data and report back on ha what kind of changes we saw over the week. Um, and if you have downloaded the latest iOS, um, you will notice that there is something called screen time built into your phone. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, in any case, whether in. you like it or not, Apple will tell you how many hours a day you spent looking at email or on social media or whatever else, um, and why. Wow, that almost, yeah, I was going to say that sounds socially good. That's mm -hmm. weird. Well, it was an activist shareholder. I had coffee with him a couple weeks ago. He's a parent, and he went back to the board and was like, we got to do something about this and ask them to be have it built into the latest iOS. Oh, man. I don't know if that's the answer, I, though. Like, you have to want to do it, right? Like, yeah. I don't, like, more tech to fix your issues with tech. I'm not a fan. Like, I think, like, you have to, it's about self-regulation. So I have a question. Yeah, One of the things gonna... that I've been hearing a lot from um, specifically high school teachers is that they are having to teach um, things that they feel that they've never had to teach in their classrooms before, uh, like eye contact and how to listen to someone hmm. and how to go away and think about something. Um, uh, does that strike you as like making sense? Like there was this one teacher in Florida who said, we have smart boards, we have iPads, they're on their phones, everything is a screen, like the whole mm -hmm. classroom. So the human to human thing now actually has to be scheduled into our day. Like we have to prioritize it. And I just thought that was really interesting. It's not good or bad, it's like. It's, is it, now wait, well, is it really good or bad? I that seems bad. I don't like to, I really don't like to be finger waggy about I'm, this stuff. I know, I think, because this was going to be, my last question was going to be, like, you wrote a book that more or less says we need to really get away from technology way more than we currently no, are. No, that's, but you're a this pro -tech now person. full circle. No, I refuse, because I think, um, I think it's extremely privileged of us to say that you should turn off your phone or quit, because in this day and age to get a job, to be connected, We're, our families are all over the place. Technology is our life, it is our livelihood. And so saying like, do a digital detox or just like put it in a, go, go on a retreat. Who can go on retreats? You know, the bros who are making this stuff, that's who can go on retreats. I can't, I have two kids and I have two pickups and there are four nannies involved and like it's chaos. And this is what makes it possible for me to be a professional woman because I can be there for my kids and connected and make it all work. So I really, to me, it's about, you. It, it's not on or off. It's how you make it work for you to the point where it is purposeful, it is enhancing your life, not driving your life. All right, let's wrap up the formal that, interview conversation then, with that gray area. I will raise the barracks. I feel like I'm like, <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you one last question that yes. we asked everybody on Dinner Party Download that oh, I don't what? get to ask that much, which is, and you've already done a lot of this tonight, but I, I think maybe on a less uh, serious note, what, tell us something we don't know. About and this me? can be about yourself or about anything in the world. Uh, this is also what okay. would happen in Dinner Party Download and then we'd cut this part. Do you? When can we know? The, the, oh, the big the sigh? Because there's always the big sigh, yeah, right? like one minute of thinking um, about it. Okay. My big break, <laughs> my big break in report, like when I transitioned from being, when I transitioned, well, from being a reporter, from a producer to a reporter, it was um, on an exploding uh, Mount Etna. I literally had a volcano erupting behind me, <laughs> and uh, the BBC, I was the producer, but the correspondent was such a, he was like, Got a jet back to Rome. See ya. And um, and then the volcano started going off, and they like put me on air. And like you cannot go wrong with a volcano going <laughs> yep. off behind you. Like you win. Yeah, like, that's the money shot. You know. So that was my big break. That's my story. <laughs> that's amazing. Is that out there? Can we find it? Why is that not on every I, social media? The lore. Thing that you I have? know volcano. Uh, just you with the By volcano. the way, people are like, "How could you be on like a volcano?" I'm like, have "Lava. It moves like this." 
you're good. It's a very slow disaster. Yeah, right. Pompeii, that obviously was a different scenario, but... Um, Apparently. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. And should we take questions? Are you ready to talk yeah, to the people? Yeah, let's do it. Um, who's got a question for Manoush? We'd like, like to There's like only 10,000 things to ask her about. Technological things. There's a things, mic coming around. Podcasting. So many volcanoes. things. Volcanoes. Hi, Manoush. Thank Thanks. you so much for being here. Um, I just, you touched, that, you touched on that you were a producer at BBC, but I want to hear more about your career path to journalism. Yeah, so I took one journalism class um, in college. <laughs> um, but I had, I thought I was, I mean, I feel like this was like such a 90s thing to say. I thought I was going to be a documentary filmmaker, right? That's 90s? So 90s, I thought it'd be it? 90s to say you're going to be in like Backstreet Boys or something. <laughs> <laughs> or, no. Or on Nickelodeon. Um, so I was going to college in D.C. And so I called. I, I was like, I guess I'll try and get a job with the BBC. And then it didn't occur to me that, like, no, it was the news bureau. This is so, I'm such a dumbass. I can't believe I'm telling you this. It all worked out. So I realized it was the news bureau. So I called them, like, literally, like, yellow pages. Or not yellow pages. White pages. <laughs> called them. And um, the bureau chief answered the phone for some weird reason. And I was like, hey, I want to come work for you. And, and he's like, what? I was like, yeah, there's this thing called an internship. And he was like, okay. So he's like, you want to, I guess I should meet you. I was like, okay. So I was the first intern they had. Where was um, this? BBC Washington Bureau. They'd never heard of an internship? No, they'd never had an intern. <laughs> Isn't that weird? That makes me not trust that news source. <laughs> well, I could tell you other stories. In any case, um, I turned up and then left 10 years later. Uh, it was one of those things. Like, I just, um, I went there and I was a hard worker and I, I logged a lot of tape, which sounds so quaint now. Like, that's kind of, but it was a great way to learn, like, how people work. Like, I went out on shoots. I had to do interviews. It was just everything. And then in... Uh, the the two correspondents who didn't have much money actually hired me as a real producer and I was on the 96 re-election campaign for Clinton. Um, so I saw the country and my parents aren't American so I'd never really traveled the country so it was kind of, it was really very cool and, and stressful. I got, uh, people thought I was Chelsea numerous times <laughs> which was really what? weird. Isn't that weird? I Yeah. Yeah, that's... I don't get it either. America. Um, and then what happened after that? So then I really wanted to leave D.C. because it can suffocate you. Um, so I applied to be a, um, a producer in their Berlin office. And everyone was like, no Americans ever escape America. You can't. You're not going to be a producer. But I got the job. Yeah. Volcano. Volcano. <laughs> and... Um, so I went to Berlin and was like, I never slept there ever. I was the breaking news person. So I ended up in Tafada in Jerusalem. We were just talking about that. That's good times. Um, other, I had a flak jacket, which was like, I never had to wear it though. I just had to carry it around to fun places. Um, I chartered like a Russian military jet to go into Belgrade after um, the parliament was on fire I got a fake visa like really fun cool like you know Indiana Jones kind of stuff it was really great and then 9-11 happened and that was not so great uh and then I flew came back to run the New York bureau there and uh, I burned out pretty hard after that and um so I quit my job as a producer and went freelance as a reporter um my volcano dreams were realized um I did a lot of red carpets like so what was your motivation with this? And did you see yourself in the character? Who are you wearing? Um, so I did a lot of that, and which is actually great like practice. And, um, and then I worked for Reuters, uh, mostly covering business, because um, you don't have to travel for that. And I got married and had a kid, and so that kind of worked for a while. And then I, I really didn't think, I didn't think I was going to go back into media um, but then this friend of mine who I'd known when I was at the BBC, he was a business editor at New York Public Radio, and we went out for lunch, and I was like, dude, you got to start covering the tech economy. It was two, 2011. 
I was like, it's gonna overtake financial services as the, the bane of the economy of the city. And he's like, well, I don't have the, anybody to do it, biatch. Um, he's like, why don't you do it? I was like, okay. Um, so I started doing that and then the station was like, we're doing podcasts and we need a woman. So, <laughs> no, I'm not joking. Um, really? Oh yeah. It was seriously like with air quotes? Like any, oh no, anybody. I added those. That's my embellishment. But there was the like, we need more women. And like, she's got a funky name. That could tick some boxes for us. And I mean, it wasn't said explicitly to me, but it's been made clear and subsequently down the road that like, oh, I, I, it was a, it made, a, solved some problems for them. Let's just say that. Mm. Um, but it was a good podcast. That was, was Note to Self? It was a good podcast, yeah. Note to Self, that's yeah, where. Yeah. And then she was on my show and you've seen the rest. And here we are. Ta-da! <laughs> um, anybody else? Right there. I have like 10,000 questions to ask you about you all do? of those oh things, but I think it's their turn. Totally. Hi, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Yeah. Um, when you were talking about the idea that tech is not neutral, one of yes. the things I thought about was how social media often affects beauty standards, and I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Oh, yes. I have lots of thoughts on that. We did a really great series as sort of our swan song at uh, Note to Self. We partnered with New York Magazine's The Cut, and we did a week looking at um, women's relationship with the internet based on generations. Um, and it was fascinating because um, we... It really depends um, what age you are, how you view the internet, and how you see yourself. And I think, you know, look, amazing things have come from it, like the Me Too movement um, never would have happened without it. It's really amazing. We had the woman on who, she was an editor at Giphy, and she looked and was like, none of these gifts look like me. So she made 25 gifts that look like her. And now there are black women on Giphy, which is super cool. This ability to like go into a place and change the norm um, is really quite fascinating. Um, on the other hand, um, you know. These some, gray areas. I know. It, the standards, I, I mean, we all know like doing it for the likes, right? And um, I think we talked a lot about this idea of like, this, I think something that I certainly did not experience as a teenager, this idea, and I experience it now, where I'm like, that would be a really good tweet, like my thought. Do you know what I mean? Where you're like this weird third person who exists to project you to the world, that's so screwy. Like this, if I stand this way and the light hits me, hmm, that'd be a good shot. People would think I was hot. You know, like that conversation that we're having with ourselves constantly and externalizing ourselves, um, that was one of the things we asked people to do during the Born and Brilliant Challenge was not take a picture for one day. And um, some people found it very, very hard. They were like, nobody knows what I'm doing. Yes, that's right. No one knows what you're doing. <laughs> and no one cares, maybe. <laughs> I'm just throwing it out there that like you've gotta be okay with what you're doing that day. Not doing it because it's a great external representation of what you're doing. It's pretty like intense, deeply psychological stuff. I love that stuff. I, I think it's fascinating. I mean, that plus the idea that people, the, the term branding being used for individuals, yes. not corporations or businesses or anything, that you have to have your personal brand but and that dude, extends you have to one? all of this. Uh, I'm this guy. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you do. I do He's Rye. He's got an Italian name. <laughs> like, right? Like, it's a thing, isn't it? Like, he's... Wow. It's, it's like, do you do consulting? I did. Uh, what before? I would I hire did, but you. But for nonprofits and human rights organizations, so... <laughs> Not quite the same. <laughs> Their personal branding wasn't quite as fun. I'm um, a kind of a charity. Um, anyone else... Oh, awesome, right in front. Hi, my name is Azadeh, and going back to your point about the funky name, I saw your name, and it's Iranian, and I have an Iranian name, so yeah. as an Iranian-American, I was wondering, how has it influenced your choices and values? Because, you know, Iranian and American, so how do you go about making choices as a, in career or personally? 
Well, I'm half, so if that diminishes me in your mind, I accept it. My cousins on that side rub it in every time. They're oh, the half breeds are here. Um, the other half is Swiss, which so I'm a weird combination, and I have not spent any time in Iran. Um, I haven't been there since I was five. Um, so my personal identity is not terribly, uh, and I would say to a detriment, it is not very much aligned with the Iranian community that my sister and brother, they, we have, they happen to have cousins that are their age, so they are very hooked into that world, but I was not. Um, I mean, like I remember my uncle who was living with us at the time in New Jersey when the revolution happened, he needed escorts on campus, the college campus, because he was unsafe. Like the demonization of Muslim Americans um, is real. I am gratified to say that I have not experienced it, at least I'm like, or at least not knowingly have experienced it, and that I live in a time when my name is a plus, because uh, there's, say that again? Because diversity, inclusion are what all these places are about now. They know that they need to step it up. I think it's ridiculous that they think by hiring me they do that because I went to school here. I have had every privilege there possibly could be. Uh, and if they think that by hiring me, they've, you know, oh, we're being very inclusive. That is utter nonsense. Uh, that internship at the BBC was free. My parents paid my rent when I did it. So um, I, I, it was actually a very big awakening for me when my producer said to me, like, you know that they think that you're a woman of color, right? And I was like, what? She's like, oh, yeah. I was like, are you, really? I, it had never occurred to me. Um, and some might say that I'm naive or that I grew up, a, who knows, there's a whole, that's a whole nother session. We can do that another time. <laughs> but, um, but I think yeah. the, the power is on you now. It yeah. is. Because the, as Rebecca Traster said so beautifully in New York Magazine, God, I love that woman. Um, people are a little scared right now. And she's like, yeah, men should be scared right now. Like, I think there's I something to that. Are you scared, man? <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> no, but I do think that there's a point to that, that like the, the, the experience that I had as the only woman and the youngest woman often with a group of men on some breaking news story and like the bullshit that I put up with, which I never would today, but I just did, like, Times have changed, and it is, it, and I don't know where we are with all of that. But like, what, what I, I, not knowing that I was thought of as a woman of color, not knowing that I could speak up for myself, not knowing a lot of these things, I feel like the veil has been lifted, literally and figuratively, um, on a lot of it. So um, it's what an extraordinary time to be alive. This is going to be our sorry. last question. Oh, sorry. Sorry. So who gets it? Anyone? One last one. I'm looking for a hand. There's somebody way back there. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Hi. Hey. Thank you again, both of you. Um, so you talked about mind wandering a lot. Yes. And how there's constructive, positive mind wandering, but also like anxiety provoking. Yes. Um, like dark Ruminating. mind wandering. Yeah. How do that you? Fun stuff. Do you have any advice for like leaning towards the productive, positive? Well, that's a great question. And I think for me. Um, the more I know what is going on in me, <laughs> the more I can identify it, Do you right? It's like cognitive behavioral therapy is all about like externalizing yourself and being like, oh, I am thinking about that conversation I had with my mom way too much and it's fine. I should either do something about it, call her and apologize uh, or just let it go. You know, it's, 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 recognizing it, almost externalizing um, what's going on in your mind so that you can make a switch. So you can say, this is not productive, this is not serving me, I'm gonna let it go. Um, what would be productive? Uh, or, or what's a, a better way of going about taking this feeling that I have and, and using it in a constructive way? Um, and I think that's, what, from what I've heard from a lot of people was, they're not having that conversation with themselves. Um, 
I, I remember this one 15 year old who came to one of the book events that we had, she came with her mom and at the end she raised her hand and she, I was like, what, you have a question? She's like, no, I have a comment. Um, this is really scary, I can't do this. And I was like, what do you mean that you can't do this? She's like, I, I, I can't be alone. I, I, I'm always online with my friends, like I can't be alone. Like she looked terrified. And I was like, oh, but you and you are gonna be together for a long time, honey. Like you should get to know you and be able to have a conversation with yourself. And she's like, okay. <laughs> so that, that was really a moment to me where I was like, wow, we have to remind, like there's, there, there are wonderful people that you wanna be in touch with. They're also not so wonderful people, but don't forget that it all comes back to home base. Can I also, she was uh, asking about uh, sort of ways to lean towards the positive side. There was, did you mention something about the past and the future in the book? It was kind of like those who tend to dwell in the past. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, ten, like if you're, th if you're letting your mind wander, wandering towards the future yes. tends to be more positive. Yes, that is true. Well, That's fascinating. Oh, you remembered that. That's yes. so nice. I'm, I'm, I'm a good reader. Yeah, like yesterday, I'm so, public radio let's move guy. forward, yeah. <laughs> Um, I hope everybody walks away from this thinking positive. And thank you so much, Manoush, for being Riku, here. Thank you. My pleasure. It's such a pleasure thank to you. meet you.